turn to the Word of the Lord. We're going to continue with the series that we have been on uh, for, it's been a few weeks since I have been preaching, but we want to make sure we've got translation. If you need to, if you're near somebody who's translating, we have French translation and we have Cantonese one-on-one -on -one Cantonese translation there. So if you need to move around for translation or whatever, please feel free to do that. We always, you know, here we're pretty flexible at Lighthouse. If you're sitting near someone who is translating and it's disturbing to you, because then just get up and move. Don't, don't be offended or whatever if you need to do that, but we want to make sure everybody can hear the Word of God in the language of their hearts. Amen? Amen. 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 We turn this morning to power, preaching, persecution, and prayer, the healing of the lame beggar. Where does this come from? Acts 3 and Acts 4. It's the first recorded miracle of the new church. Is it the first miracle? No, it's not the first miracle. If we look at the end of Acts chapter 2, we know that many miracles are taking place. Why are they taking place? Because the disciples are so great? No because Jesus has returned to heaven and he has fulfilled his promise which was you wait and in a few days the Father and I will send the Holy Spirit. He had earlier told them go into all the world preach the gospel to every creature baptizing them, them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit I will be with you. All of these things but they could not do what Jesus had called them to do until they received the equipping that Jesus and the Father promised to give them. It was true then it is true today. God puts things in our hearts. God opens our eyes to needs in the world. God pulls our hearts to do something, to reach people, to bless people, to encourage people, to correct people. But we cannot do it in our own ability. We cannot do it in our own power. If we do it in our own ability, we will get tired. If we do it in our own ability, our strength will fall short. If we do it in our own ability, what comes out may be too soft or too hard. When we do it in our own ability, we may offend people and turn them away. When we do it in our own ability, it will, it will be harsh and people won't respond. Why? Because it's not coming in God's power, in God's authority, and in God's anointing. But when we do what God has called us to do, in the power of His Spirit, by His timing, by His direction, by His leading, then God will do what He intended to do through you, with you, in that moment, for that situation. That's His responsibility. And when you and I understand that, it takes the pressure off of us, doesn't it? It takes the, it takes the burden off of, I've got to make them respond. I've got to make them repent. I've got to make them believe Jesus. That is not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to obey the Lord, to receive from the Lord what He has, and to go where He's called us to go. And then the power of God and the presence of Jesus will do what only God can do. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we he see this in the healing of the lame beggar. Let's move forward a little bit. Um, let's look at slide two. Peter and John are going in their regular activity, and we've talked about this before, so I don't want to take a lot of time this morning, and I'm speaking a little bit quickly. If I start going too fast, just wave your hand, and I'll slow down just a little bit. But we see that Peter and John are going about their regular activity. They don't have a special revelation from God. Today, God is going to do something big through us. Every once in a while, God will do that. God will give us uh, a holy anticipation that He's going to do something. But He doesn't always do that. You and I need to be ready in season and out of season, ready in touch with the Holy Spirit always so that since we're plugged into Him, then when He wants to, at His planning and at His timing, He can move us, He can touch us, He can speak through us. And that's what we see here. And the way that, brothers and sisters, the way that the Holy Spirit worked then 
is still the way that the Holy Spirit works today. There's so much for us to learn from this, sto from this story, from this event that really happened. And so they go about their everyday business. The lame beggar is going about his everyday business. He is taken to the temple and he begs. And he hopes to get a little bit of money so that his belly is full for that day and he will be taken home and the next day he will go back to the, he will be taken back to the temple and he will beg and his belly will be full for that day but god is always bigger than our expectations and what god wanted to do was something wonderful god wants to change his life and peter and john full of the holy spirit say what they don't have silver and gold, but what do they have? They have a relationship with God. They have authority from Jesus Christ who told them to go. And they have power through the Holy Spirit. These three things. And these three things are necessary to fulfill the works of the Lord. A relationship with God. An up-to-date relationship with God. An ongoing relationship with God an authority from Jesus Christ who said, go and do, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And when all of these things are present in our lives, we will do the works that God has called us to do in this world. Sometimes it may be small, sometimes it may be big, but it's all God's work. Don't look at this and just think, well, I could never do that. I could never pray for somebody. I could never announce to a lame person, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Well, honestly, I look at that and think, well, I don't know if I could either. But we are not, we're not to judge our lives and our calling by what happens in this story. We are to look at what they did and we are to do what they did, depending on the Lord, listening to the Lord in a relationship with God, authority from Jesus Christ, and power through the Holy Spirit. And we've talked about power. Slide three. We talked about this. We spent several weeks talking about this. This power comes from Jesus. It is God's power, and it is the power to transform lives. Most people just want a little help from Jesus just to make it through to the next day, right? I just want my life to be a little bit better. I just, I don't want to be so miserable. I want to feel a little bit better than I'm feeling now. I feel a little guilty and I don't want to feel so guilty. My life is kind of in a mess and I don't want to be in such a mess anymore. Now God will help people where they are. But God wants to free people. God wants to get people out of darkness and into life. His power is available to take people who are in bondage and to set them free. He wants to take hearts that are full of hatred and fill them with His love. He wants to take hearts that are bound by bitterness and let them be hearts that are forgiveness. And only the power of God can do that. A little sermon can't do that. A little talk can't do that. A little help can't do that. The power of God does that. The power of God does that. And brothers and sisters, I believe we live at such a low level in our relationship with God, don't we? We live down here with so little expectation of the power of God available to work in us and through us. And God wants us to live at this level, at this level where Peter and John were living, where every disciple of Christ should be living. And then Peter says, as we saw that, we say, he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Now, I, I want us to notice some, this, something this morning as we look at this, and I want to talk about the name of Jesus just a little bit, just as a reminder. And we go to the next slide the name of Jesus, we look at this story, and I've been talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, but I want you to see something this morning. This story is not focusing on the Holy Spirit. I want you to look at these things just in chapter 3. Do you see what I note? Do you see what I see? This is about Jesus Christ. This is the name of Jesus. Look at this in 3.8, in 3.13, in 3.13 and 14, in 3.15, in 316, and then it goes further, in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus, the author of life, this same Jesus, the servant Jesus, the name of Jesus Christ, his servant Jesus. What is this about? 
always. It's about Jesus, brothers and sisters. It's about Jesus. And we'll leave this up a little bit so you can look at it. But let me give you a little bit of detective Bible homework this week before we meet again next week. I've done the legwork for you on, on chapter 3. I challenge you to finish up the rest of the story in chapter 4 and see how this theme, the name of Jesus, is continued in chapter 4. Don't do it right now. Don't do it. Listen to the sermon right now. Some of you are, oh, okay. It's really easy. Wait until, wait until the sermon is over. But do that this week. Go and read chapter 4 and just make some notes and say, okay, where does this theme continue? And you will see that it's the same theme, chapter 3 and chapter 4. In fact, there's more even than I put, than I put up here in chapter 3. Why is this so? Because the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and in my life, one of the main works, he has many works, but one of the main works is not to say, what a great church we have. It's not to say, oh, our denomination is so great, or I'm such a great person. But the work of the Holy Spirit is to bring attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is called, it's the Spirit, he's called the Spirit of Jesus. He's called the Spirit of Jesus. And when the Holy Spirit has His place in our lives, we won't be weird. We won't be wild. We won't be flaky. We won't be out of control. Our lives will glorify Jesus. Our lives will lift up Jesus. People will be around us and they will say, Oh, they may not say it to your face, but when the Holy Spirit is doing His work, do you know what will happen in your life? People will be drawn to you and they won't always know why. There will be something about you and they'll wonder, what is it? Why is this person different? Because Jesus is being lifted up in your life. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the, one of the primary works of the Holy Spirit. Remember what Jesus told his disciples the night before he went to the cross? Jesus said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, He will tell you about me. He will take what is of mine, because Jesus already knew I'm going back to heaven. He will take what is of mine and reveal it to you. He will take what is of me and reveal it to you. Do you want to know Jesus better? Do you want to get a glimpse and a vision of Jesus? Submit your life to the Holy Spirit and let him have his way working in you and working through you and Jesus will be glorified and Jesus will be magnified. That is certainly what we see in this story. That's what we see in this story. Brothers and sisters, I think as Christians we have gotten so far, and I'm not saying this in a condemning way, but honestly, we, we look at the Christian world and we listen to what is preached in so many pulpits and what is said by so many. What do we hear people talking about so much? What, what do we hear people talking about? My church, yeah? My denomination, my works. And all of these things are part of our Christian lives, but they're not the main thing. When you and I lift up Jesus in our lives, mm -hmm. then the Holy Spirit will move and work in wonderful ways, amen? My denomination will not save anybody. My church will not save anybody. My works will not save anybody. God can use these things, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit who magnifies Jesus in our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, this is only the first half of the story, and we'll get to chapter 4 later. But I want us to go a little bit further, and then we began to talk about preaching as well in slide five. And we talked about that, that God's will is always in a context and the framework of his timing. And brothers and sisters, this is what often frustrates us, isn't it? We know that God has a will for us. We know that God is calling something, calling us to do something, or he's calling us for something. And we're ready and we're praying. Maybe it's the salvation of our families. Maybe it's let's do this, or God is, wants me to go do this, or God wants me to reach these people, or I'm supposed to be doing this and we struggle and we pray and we don't see it happening but we see as we come into this next part as we've talked about before and now let's go on to slide six that we see in the lives of Peter and John we see that it was in the context and the timing of God God Jesus was when he walked with him he did not 
He did not heal that lame man. They walked by that lame man. How many times? Because the lame man always went to the temple. But obedience and a step of faith. Look carefully. Here's a principle for your life and my life. Obedience and a step of faith always come before what? Explanation and understanding. Can we say that together just to remind ourselves? Obedience, a step of faith before Amen. And we see that as we move into this next section. Why didn't Jesus heal that lame man those 40 plus years as he sat there, as they went in and out of the temple? Because God's will was set in the context of God's timing. And brothers and sisters, there may be things in your life in your heart, God has whispered to you and you think, God, is this you? God, this is a good thing. God, I'm praying about it. And you and I get frustrated in our heart. We're trying to make things happen. Trust God, obey, and take the step of faith that He has called of you before God gives you explanation or understanding. And then you will see God move and work in His timing. Amen? Amen. And why? Do we see this at this point? Because God was working for the greater good. And what is the greater good? We see this in the next slide. Acts 13, 12 through 15. People hear the lame man who is now jumping up and down, leaping, praising God, saying, Glory to God! He has healed me! Praise the Lord! He was shouting. He was leaping. He was making a commotion. And he was jumping up and down. And I don't know about you, but at first, probably everybody was thinking, because, you know, this is a real story. Put yourself, put yourself in that situation. Imagine you were there on that day. You have gone to the temple. You have gone to pray. Maybe you've brought an offering. You're going to be there for the sacrifice. And you're being solemn and holy because it's God's house. And suddenly, there's a commotion, and the commotion disturbs you. Commotions disturb us, don't we? Don't they? Be quiet. Shh. What? So put yourself in that position. Put yourself in that. They're going about, we're here to meet with God. And then they hear this noise. They hear this commotion, and it draws their attention. And I'll bet you at first, they were probably thinking, tell that man to shut up, right? Somebody, temple guards, go get him to be quiet. And then they look, and then they see, wait a minute, it's the lame man. Now imagine if you were there. This is a real story, brothers and sisters, really. Imagine you seeing, what if right outside Lighthouse, right outside Lighthouse, on San Lamdo, Hillwood, right out there, right next to the Chinese, maybe the Korean barbecue or the, or the Chinese massage place next door, a lame man was there every Sunday as you came in and out, in and out, in and out, begging. And because you're a good Christian, you, put, you give him some money. And then one Sunday, the power of Jesus heals him. And he comes running into this church, shouting and leaping. It would get your attention, wouldn't it? It would get mine. And so people look first, and then they see it's a miracle. And here's where we see the beautiful, wonderful timing of God. He saw his opportunity and he addressed the crowd. And he starts preaching. And I want us to leave this up just a little bit. So just take a look at it. There's, the sermon is longer than this. You know, Peter has never been accused of preaching, of speaking too short a time. Ever. Ever. Peter was a talker. You know, he, that's one of the reasons I relate to him. You know, he was a talker. But Paul was a talker too. But we see this with Peter, and he starts preaching. And the sermon, we're only looking right now at verses 12 through 15. The sermon goes all the way through to verse 26, to the end of the chapter. Are you ready for a spoiler alert? You know what stops the sermon? Peter doesn't get to the end of his notes, but Peter gets arrested. And that's what stops the sermon, okay? So, but we look at this part, and I want us to see some things about this part. And we see Peter saw his opportunity, and we've talked about this before. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes to opportunities, to God-given opportunities, brothers and sisters. Things that you didn't expect, things that you didn't see. God 
opens our eyes. That's one of the works of, our, of the Holy Spirit. What else do we see? We see that Peter, full of the Holy Spirit and controlled by the Holy Spirit, gives glory to whom? To whom? Ah, to Jesus. It's the God of all our ancestors who's brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. Peter takes no credit. And I want you to be encouraged here. Peter says very clearly, why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power and godliness? Peter understood, I'm a common person. Before Jesus dealt with him, before the death and resurrection of Jesus, before the baptism and the control of the Holy Spirit in Peter's life, Peter was full of Peter. He was. I'll do this. I can do that. But when the Holy Spirit began to do His work in his life, then he was full of Jesus. And Jesus controlled Peter. The Holy Spirit controlled him. Brothers and sisters, listen carefully. Here is one of the marks of the Spirit-filled life. It's not just speaking in tongues. It's not just a feeling. It's not just, ooh, this or that. When the Holy Spirit is in control of our lives and we are Spirit-filled, our lives will be subject to Him and our lives will glorify Jesus. And Peter says, don't look at us like we're something fancy. Don't look at us like we're something special. And you know what? That encourages me right here at this point. And it should encourage you as well. Because Peter is saying, let me paraphrase, Peter is saying, I'm nobody special. Now I can say that about myself, and you can say that about yourself, can't you? I'm nobody special, but Jesus is special. And he says it's Jesus who does it. So be encouraged. Be encouraged. When God calls you to do something, when God leads you to something, and you look at it and you think, this is too big for me. I can't do it. Well, you're right. It is too big for you, but it's not too big for God. You can't do it, but God can do it because we're nobody special. Jesus is somebody special. And so he gives credit to Jesus. And then he says, Jesus did this. And I want us to see something else that is included in this passage, although he doesn't say it directly. He says, this is the same Jesus. It's the same Jesus. What point is Peter making when he says, it's the same Jesus? Peter is saying, in effect, when Jesus walked to this earth, what did he do? He healed people. He forgave. He delivered. He loved. He raised the dead. He healed the sick. He took those that were outcast and he made them welcome. Why should you be surprised that Jesus in heaven continues to do what he has always done? He is the same Jesus. And brothers and sisters, I want you to be encouraged this morning. The same Jesus that did that when he walked this earth is still the same Jesus today. Hebrews 13, 8 says what? Jesus Christ, say it with me. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same Jesus. And whatever needs are in your life, whatever you are facing, whatever is going on, He's the same Jesus. His power is available in your life and my life still today. You don't have to walk out of these doors this morning disappointed. We don't have to walk out of these doors the same way we walked in, broken and hurting and needy because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You don't see Him. You can't touch Him. But the power of the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Jesus, is with us today, is here today to do the works of Jesus that were seen when He walked this earth. It is Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Come to Him. Open your heart to Him. Open your life to Him. Cry out to Him and call out to Him wherever you are and whatever you are. You don't have to wait until you're good enough. You don't have to wait until you get all your mess 
figured out. You don't have to wait until you get everything sorted out. You look at Jesus. Did he wait till people got it all together? Did he wait till everything is okay? No. Jesus came to people exactly where they were. He came to a woman at the well. He went to find her. That woman at the well was little better than a prostitute. Really, little better than a prostitute. Had five husbands and she was living with one that wasn't a husband. Now that tells us something about some of the men that she had relationships with as well. But we see this woman. Jesus went to her and found her. You don't have to wait till you get better. You don't have to wait till you can make things pretty for Jesus. You come to Jesus as you are and He changes what you are into what He can make you to be. Don't wait. Don't wait. The Spirit of Jesus is here today. So we see this. And then I want us to go a little bit further. And I want us to go back again. Let's look back at the passage again that we just looked at. And I want you to see something. We see Peter saw his opportunity, and I want you to see something here. Miracles don't save anybody. Miracles are wonderful. The moving of God in mighty power is a great thing, and God uses it, but miracles don't save people. The Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit is what touches it is what leads people into the kingdom. What does it say in Romans 10, 17? It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Hearing by the word. Now there's nothing, please, please don't get the idea, well, Pastor Jennifer's preaching against miracles. I am not. I am not. But what do we see here? Peter knows now the miracle of God has people's attention. Now let me preach the word of God to them. And that is one, that's not the only purpose of miracles. God brings healing to, to people today. God works miracles even today. But God also uses those miracles to draw people. As I was preparing yesterday, I was reading about a, a, a preacher and an evangelist who is long, long dead. He's from the UK. His name was Samuel Chadwick. Have any of you ever heard of him before? Samuel Chadwick. Wonderful. A man of God. He was born in the 18... 30s or 60s. I can't remember now. I was searching online. But Samuel Chadwick loved God and he was reading the Bible. He started to work. He very, very poor. No education whatsoever. Uh, and at eight years old, he began to work with his father. I think his father was a ma machinist. And he began, it was a very godly family, and the family was a Methodist family. So this is in the UK, so 150 more years ago. And, but he loved God, and he began preaching at the age of 16. And he read the Gospel of John and the Spirit of God touched his heart with the story of Lazarus. And as God began to use him, do you know what Samuel Chadwick would pray and target? He began to go to different churches. He began to, he would preach outside throughout England and I think, uh, and then his sermons and I think, I think he went to the U.S. at some point as well. He took a ship and went to the U.S. I'm still looking for his biography. I was looking online. I want to read more about it. But this story really touched me because he read the story of Lazarus in John chapter 12 and God touched him and that became a tool of his ministry when he preached. He would go into a town where there was terrible sin, there was alcoholism, there were all sorts of things going on. And you know what he would do? He would look in that town for the hardest person in the town, the greatest drunkard, the worst person. And you know what he would do? He would target him in prayer. He was, Sam and Chadwick was a, he was a preacher who, who who prayed, 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 prayed. And he would target the hardest person. And for him, it was the Lazarus principle. Because he looked at the story of Lazarus in the Bible and said, oh, look, Jesus raised Lazarus and it drew people's attention. Many people came and many people were saved. And he made that a point of his preaching ever after that, whatever town he went into. And he would say, Lord, Who's the toughest? Well, toughest is a modern language. That's not what he would say. He, he would probably say, who is the most abject sinner, oh God, or something like that. But he would target and he would begin to pray for that person. And then what would happen is God would 
would save that person, would convict that person of sin and of the life, the terrible lifestyle. The person would come, would get saved, and then the town would turn to the Lord as well because they had seen the mighty power of God at work in an impossible situation. That's what we see here, don't we? We see here, God heals a layman. Here's the purpose and the timing of God. And then what happens? People come running to see the power of God. May I challenge you this morning to do something? I'm going to challenge you, and I'm challenging myself as well. In your life, in your situations, in your families, you have, or in your villages, you have people or students or employees or employers who are really, really tough. Yeah? Really hard really bad. Bad. You know what I mean. <laughs> Please don't go to them and say, you know, you're so awful, I'm going to start praying for you. <laughs> when a person has all sorts of mess, you know, and I say that because sometimes we do that, don't we? <laughs> don't talk to them. Start talking to God about them, okay? Start talking to God about them and say, God, let me start. I want to start praying for this person. I want to start praying for this person. God, save this person. God, you love them. And you know what you will find out? You will find out, number one, your heart will change for that person. Because sometimes bad people, we don't want to be around them, right? We don't like them very much, do we? Maybe we're a little bit angry at them. Maybe we find it hard to forgive them because maybe they've hurt us as well. Maybe they've damaged our family. Maybe they've brought grief to our loved ones. That's very, very common with people who are really, really messed up. But if you will start praying for that person, you know what will happen? Before they are changed, God will change you. And that person that you thought is just terrible. I can't stand to be around them. You know what will happen? you will start saying, you will start feeling love for that person. You will start having grace for that person when you never had grace before. God, it's true, it's true. God can do that. Let God work the Lazarus principle in your life, through your life. Let God do this as he did for Peter, for the lame beggar. I think that's one of the things that God loves to do. Ian and Monica and Aunt Monica's mother are sitting here. You have met Ian's father before. Um, uh, they were here, uh, Pastor Allen. They were here and he prayed. Uh, he prayed one Sunday morning. And he has a lot of crusades in India, uh, throughout India, and, and various people go with him at various times. And a few months ago in one of the crusades, as part of the crusade, do you know what God did? True what happened. Among the many things that God did, He raised a dead woman back to life. True story. He raised a dead woman back to life. Now I have a question. Was there a bigger crowd after that? I'm thinking maybe there was. I'm thinking maybe there was. Because God wants to touch not just one woman, God wants to touch everyone. And God wants to touch the people around you. And so Peter sees his opportunity and he addressed the crowd because faith comes by hearing. Now, I want you to notice one other thing about this sermon. And I love this. Come to the bottom and look with me at verse 15. And I want you to read verse 15 just a minute. We'll go ahead and get to the next slide. Here's verse 15. Okay? Look at this. This is verse 15, and I want to ask you something. How? Some people say, at Lighthouse, you preach pretty hard sometimes. We do, don't we? We preach pretty directly at times, don't we? Well, if you think we preach directly, look at how Peter preached right here. He called them a bunch of murderers, didn't he? He said, you killed the author of life. Murderers! Murderers, And I want you to, I have a question for you that we're going to come back to in just a minute, but I have a question for you right now. Number one, how would you like to get to receive a sermon like this? How would you like to hear this? Murderers, you killed the author of life. 
That's pretty confrontational, isn't it? It seems very bold, it seems very confrontational, and it seems very condemning, doesn't it? It seems very condemning. So I want us to think about that for just a minute, and then we're going to come back to it. Because when we look at this, if we look at this without the context, you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of all of those people that say, you're going to go to hell if you don't do this. You're really bad, and if you don't repent, you're going to, you know what, God's going to judge you, and bad things are going to happen to you. That's what this reminds us of when we see this. So what is Peter doing when he says this? Hang on to it. Is he confronting and is he condemning? We'll come back to that in just a minute, but hang on to this. And now I want us to see one other thing. Keep this verse up, but I want you to see the other part of this. All of this is in the, is in the sermon. God raised him from the dead, and then what does Peter say next? And we are witnesses of this fact. We are witnesses of this fact. And brothers and sisters, I want to underline something for you in your life. As you live for God, as you tell people about God, as you share the love of God in all of these situations, people will argue with you. You can talk about the Bible and people say, well, I don't believe that. How can you say that's the only way? And there will be times that people with argue, will argue with you. They will argue doctrine. They will argue questions. They will argue uh, philosophically. They will argue theologically. There will be all sorts of arguments that come against you when you share about Jesus Christ. But let me tell you one thing. There are two things that people cannot argue against. Number one, and I've said it before, people can't argue against love, can they? God loves you. The, love, love, love. You love somebody, what can they do? Don't love me. Get away from me. There's no argument against love. And that's why the New Testament says so much about love. And that's why we should have the love of God in our hearts. And the love of God is going to reach people. The love of God is going to touch people. So that's one thing. But that's not the only thing. And I want you to see something here. An effective part of testifying, an effective part of proclaiming God and Jesus is personal testimony. Do you see this? It's personal testimony. Now you can study everything. I have the four spiritual laws and I have studied them and I can quote them. And thank God for the four spiritual laws. Thank God for the two questions of EE. E. Thank God for all of these things. But brothers and sisters, they're tools. And people will say, yes, but there's this. Yes, but there's that. Always make sure when you share with people that you are part of the testimony, that you are part of the sharing. And what you can say is, I can't answer all your questions. Let me look it up. Let me think about it. I don't know all of the Bible verses, but I can tell you this. I was lost and now I'm found. I was broken and now I'm whole. I was bound, but now I'm free. I walked in darkness, but now I'm in light. Once I hated, but now I love. Once I had bitterness, but now I can forgive. And nobody can argue against that. Let your message of Jesus include your life because Jesus transforms our lives. And that's part of what Peter and John are saying. He says, we are witnesses of that fact. We saw it. We were there. We touched him. And there's no argument against that. And it's not said in superiority. It's not said in a looking down way. It's just a sharing. This is my life. This is my life. This is one of the reasons, brothers and sisters, that when I stand before you in the pulpit, I try to be honest with you about my own life. I, and Pastor Renee as well. We try to be honest with you about, we struggle with this. We have where God is still working on this in li our life. God is still working, but God has done this. Why? Because we're all people. We're all people, and God works in us. But we all have the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives, in our lives. Study, and you should. Prepare, and you should. Be equipped, and you should. But always let your life be part of what you share with people. Amen? Amen. 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 Now we continue. 
And then we see in Acts 3.16 that Peter says, again, here's our theme, through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed, and you know how crippled he was before. There was no denying it, was there? There was no denying it. And this is why I love this, I love this miracle. It's so great. Every single person standing there looking at that man, jumping up and down, could say, yeah, I walked by him outside the temple gate. I gave him money before. I've given him money. I gave him something. I gave him some food. I know who it is. Every one of them, every one of them could, could see that. And he says it was through faith in the name of Jesus. And then what does he do? He says it again. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Amen. Now, let's look at what happens next. Then he says, he continues and he says, Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. But God was fulfilling what all the prophets had said. And I want you to see something here this morning. Here's this very terrible verse. You did it in ignorance, but you did it. You killed the author of life. But I want us to see, as we look at that, the wonderful part that goes with that. Because we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. Here we see God doing it. God had a purpose. God used the most evil act in the history of mankind. We look at that. Was that worse? than the Holocaust in Germany? That's worse than the Holocaust. Was that worse than all of the genocide between the Hutus and the Tutsis? Worse than that. Was that worse than what North Korea has done to Christians, what Romania did to Christians, what, to what Rome did to Christians? Here's the worst thing possible. But God can take what is evil and turn it for good for His purposes because He is God. And if He did it then, He still does it today. And Paul reminds Christians, and we're reminded this morning, that the terrible things in your life, the broken things in your life, the, the things that you think, Oh God, how could this be? Oh God, why did this happen? We put it in the hands of our great and powerful powerful and loving God and our God is able to bring good out of it. Our God is able to make beautiful what is not yet beautiful. And if you look at the pieces of your life and you've come to God and they're still broken and it's still not put together and it's still not the way that you want it, wait on the timing of God. Don't give up. Don't turn away. Don't go back and say, well, God doesn't keep His word. God doesn't answer, fulfill His promises. He has lied. He hasn't done it. You hold on. Wait for the timing of God and He will take what is broken and He will make it beautiful in your life. Hold on to God. This is what He will do. He has done it throughout the history of mankind. If you're going through a deep pit right now, you're in a deep pit and you think, Oh God, where are you? You keep calling out to God. You keep looking to God. You keep waiting on God. And He will cause everything to work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. If God could do it, in Jesus, who was crucified, the, the author of life. You think he can't do it in your life and my life? Of course he can. Of course he can. Now let's go back to the question that I asked you earlier. In Peter's preaching, you killed the author of life. So confrontational, so condemning. Is this what Peter is doing? And we look now at Acts 13, 19, and 20. And he comes to his point, which was going to be his point all along. And he says, repent of your sins and turn to God, or be converted, so that your sins may be wiped away or blotted out. Remember when we did the sermon series, Who Keeps a Record of Sin? Blotted out was one of the phrases that we looked at, wasn't it? 
Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and He will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. Hang on to this, brothers and sisters, and let's look at this. Again, as He did on the day of Pentecost, Peter calls them to do what? Repent. Call them to repent. He is telling them, here's what the word repents, to turn around in their thinking and their actions. It doesn't mean being sorry. You see, they had thought a certain way about Jesus. And I want you, it sounds like such a harsh word, doesn't it? Sometimes when people say, repent! Uh, go ahead and show slide 14, Andreas. I, I, looked, I want you to take a look at this. Can you see it? Now, I don't know about your country. I don't know about your country. But this took place in America because you see? See that? Okay? So see, I'm not talking about your country. I'm talking about my country. Okay? America repent. And America needs to repent. But honestly, as we look at this, honestly, uh, by the way, if you'll read through this, you will probably find yourself on this sign somewhere. <laughs> okay? Especially if you... You're, almost all of us are here somewhere, okay? And just take a look at that. And, and I, when I looked at this, I just laughed. I really did. I just laughed. But when we hear the word repent, honestly speaking, that's... Jashing is trying to see, am I on there? Jashing, you, you, I don't know if you are or not. But most of us probably were or are there somewhere. Do, do you see all of this? And uh, rich people, I don't know if Lighthouse has any rich people or not, but repent. And I, I really like the bottom part. And worldly, lukewarm, once saved, always saved Christians are in danger of hell's fire. But we look at this, and I don't know when this took place, but this took place, and this did take place in the States. And by the way, before you all say, Pastor Jennifer, you're being soft on sin because, in fact, a lot of these people are going to go to hell. And it's true. It's true. Because sin will, take, will send us to hell. That's true. But that's not my point right now. The point is when we so often think about the word repent or we think of something like this, we, this is what we think of, don't we? When, when a preacher preaches repent, when we hear a sermon about repentance, this is what we think. And if we're not careful, when we look at Peter's preaching, this is what we think also. But I want us to look at what Peter means. Now, I know you're interested in this slide, but let's go on to more edifying things, okay? <laughs> let's look at slide 15. Repentance is not regret. I'm sorry I got caught. I'm in a mess. Have you ever repented that way? I'm sorry I got caught. I'm in a mess. When my, my parents, you all know that I came from a Christian family, and sometimes uh, I would get, we would get, my parents believed in, discipline of this sort. Uh, this was the type of discipline and other disciplines as well, but that was one of the dipl disciplines I got. And when we would sometimes get caught, my parents would, would spank us and I would always say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And you know what my dad and mom would always say, because they were very wise, they would say, are you sorry you did it or are you sorry you got caught? And honestly, most of the time, I was just sorry I got caught. But repentance is not regret. I'm sorry I got caught. I'm in a mess. Repentance is not just remorse. I feel terrible and I want to feel better, although it will involve, involve our feelings. Repentance is not penance. Doing penance to show we're very sincere. It's not that because I want to show God I really mean it. I really mean it. But that is not repentance. Repentance is, instead, admitting that what God says is true and changing our minds about our sins and about the Savior. That's what repentance is. That's what repentance is. And it's, it has to include this. And brothers and sisters, this is why Peter says to them, and we come to a close this morning, this is why Peter says to them, Repent. Do you know why? Because repent is a word of hope. Repent is a word of hope. Repent says to the person, and, and they have to know, you were a sinner. You killed the author of life. You were all of this. But you can repent. 
And it's not bad news. Repent is good news. Go ahead, Ian. Yeah, go ahead. Repent is not bad news. Repent is good news. Because repent means you are going this way. And you did that. But you can turn around and go in another direction. That's what repent means. It's a word of hope. It's a word of hope. And Peter says, we go back to Acts 3, 19 and 20 and slide 16. Repent. Change your mind and your purpose. Turn around. Return to God that your sins may be erased. And brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you this morning and challenge you this morning. Repent. And I'm not talking about that terrible slide that we just saw. But you know your life. And I know my life. Repent. You're going in this direction and you're going in the wrong direction. You've been going this way and you don't need to be going that way. You're doing things that maybe nobody but you and God know about and you need to repent. It's not condemnation. It's not you're bad and you're going to hell. But it is hope in God who loves you. The very people who said crucify Him. Send Him to the cross. The very people who spat upon Jesus, who mocked Him as He, stood on, as he was nailed to the cross naked and they made fun of Him and they pulled out His beard. To those very people, God again sent Jesus. Why? Because He loved them and He loves us. If you don't know Jesus at all this morning, Here's the opportunity for you. Repent. Turn around from the way you've been going and go in a different direction. Leave that way and go God's way and He will change your life and do a work in your life. If you're a Christian this morning and there are areas of your life where you need to repent, then do it. What are you waiting for? What am I waiting for? The Spirit of Jesus is here. He's here. Repent. Not because you're bad and because you're going to hell, but because God loves you and He gives you Jesus. Brothers and sisters, it's not enough to feel sorry. It's not enough to feel bad. It's not enough to, I hope I don't get caught. That's not enough. But repent. Agree with God when He says, you're a sinner but I love you and I give you Jesus. Could we just close our eyes this morning as the, as the music is playing? You don't need my words this morning. I'm going to pray with you. You know the words to pray. And as I pray, would you pray this morning? And if you don't know the words to pray, you can use the words that I'm praying this morning. But just talk to God this morning. Lord, we come to you we hear the words that Peter said to that crowd that crucified Jesus, that murdered the author of life. And he said, repent. And God, when he said repent, then he said that times of refreshing may come, that Jesus may come. And Lord, we come to you this morning. Lord, some of us have been afraid to come because we thought we've done so much wrong and so much bad that you, it would be hard for you to love us and we've been scared to come to you. But Lord, we look at this story and if you gave them Jesus after they had crucified Him, oh Lord, then you love us too. You love us too. And so we come to you this morning in repentance. In repentance. And we say, I'm sorry, Lord. You're right about me. I have sinned. And I have fallen short. Lord, this area of my life that nobody else knows about, you know about. And I present it to you and I come back to you. And I change from where I was going and I come in your way. And God, I confess I'm weak. But Lord, I want you to change me. I want you to cleanse me, please. Would you accept me and receive me? And Lord, your word says that when we come to you, you will not cast us out. You will not say, you're so bad, get away, 
You're not good enough to be my child, but you have said and you have promised that you will receive us. You will receive me. You will love me. You will bring me into your family. You will restore me. You will cleanse me. You will put your joy in my life. You will take what is broken and make it whole. You will take the hatred and turn it into love. I give you the bitterness and you will turn it into forgiveness. You will do in me what I cannot do in myself. And so I run to you and I repent. I repent. I repent this morning. I repent this morning. Forgive me, oh God. You're right. You're right. I've been fooling myself and I've been fooling others. But I don't want to do that anymore. I repent. And I have hope in you that you forgive, that you love, and that you restore. And so, Lord, I receive from you this morning. I receive from you what you have for me because I've repented this morning. I have repented and I mean it. I mean it. You are right. And you're right about Jesus and I accept it and I receive it. Oh, make a difference in my life. Change my life. Lord, I want more than just a little help. Lord, I need transformation in my life. And I come to you and I receive from you. I receive from you. And I wait for you. And Lord, I ask you, I ask you, Lord, to change me. Lord, change me today. Lord, when I walk out from this door and I face the same temptation, Lord, keep changing me. And tomorrow, keep changing me. And the next day, keep changing me. Strengthen me. Convert me, Lord. Keep changing me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that Jesus might be seen in my life. Thank you, Lord. If you have prayed this this morning, would you just tell him thank you right now? Just say, thank you, Jesus. And just tell him very simply, I receive what you give me this morning. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your love. I receive your transformation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And we pray this in that name that healed a lame man, in that name that raised a dead person, in the name of the one who calmed the storm and walked on the waters, in the name of the one who took five loaves and two fishes and broke it and multiplied it for all the need, in the name of the one who loves us, went to the cross for us, rose again, and lives with us each day, in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. Walk with Jesus. Walk with Jesus this week. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Believe and receive.